El día de hoy tenemos al doctor Richard Davidson, presidente del Centro para las Mentes Sanas de la Universidad de Wisconsin, y a la doctora Peggy Lulane Rockefeller. Ella es líder de Sinergos, una organización filantrópica a nivel mundial. Eh, estará moderando el panel el maestro Agustín Barrios Gómez, consejero de Comexi. Y le pido a Daniela Labra, socia fundadora y directora general de Atentamente, que nos dé unas palabras de bienvenida. Gracias a todos. Pues buenas noches a todos. Bienvenidas, bienvenidos. Es, yo soy Daniela Labra, como dijo Katy, yo soy directora general de Atentamente Consultores y es un honor para nosotros estar aquí esta noche con todos ustedes y con nuestros panelistas. Welcome, thank you for being here. Pero ¿para qué? Para pensar en un nuevo liderazgo, en cómo educar y aprender habilidades para el bienestar personal y social. El gran reto de nuestro tiempo es humano. Cómo aprender a ser y convivir. Y no simplemente a sobrevivir, sino a florecer. Y si sí se puede. El bienestar no es un don, sino una habilidad que como todas se puede desarrollar y para todos. Today the country and our region face many, many important challenges, um, including of course violence, inequality, corruption on our side of the border, um, growing racism on, on the other side of the border. And all of this, I suspect, has much to do with how emotionally limited we still are as, as human beings. And, uh, and I think that that's why it's so important that we're here today. So in Mexico, thanks to the good offices of many people, many of those actually here represented in civil society, at the UNDP, at our Ministry of Education, we've taken a step towards giving people those tools for socio-emotional learning, what's known in the trade as SEL, Why all the hoopla? What, how do we know that this works? And what are we looking for when we talk about SEL? Socio-emotional learning or social-emotional learning is fundamental for several different reasons. I'll share a few scientific facts. There are findings which show that a child's social and emotional capacities when she or he is four and five years of age are the single best predictor of major adult life outcomes when the individual is in their early 30s after taking into account the socioeconomic status of the families, medical issues, intelligence. It turns out that these social emotional qualities, particularly a child's capacity for self-regulation, is an extraordinarily important predictor of outcomes like the propensity to abuse drugs at age 32, physical health, the likelihood of being adjudicated uh, within the court system for criminal behavior. And finally, data show that individuals who have a greater socio-emotional capacity at this age actually end up as young adults to earn more money. So these qualities really matter. And one of the qualities which is so important for social emotional learning is attention. Uh, and attention is the building block for all other forms of learning. In a recent study published in a very prestigious so scientific journal the in the United word. States, it was found that the average American adult spends 47% of her or his waking life not paying attention to what they're doing. One of the things that we've learned in modern science is that these qualities can actually be educated. And this is why I think this, this conversation is so important. And it turns out there is a, a meta-analysis, which is an analysis of many studies that was published a few years ago with uh, a sample size that was greater than 280,000 children And what it found is that social emotional learning, uh, social emotional education actually produced increases of 11% on standardized test scores. If we are going to be leaders, if we're going to be our best person out there in the world, doing our best to do our work, be good family members, 
help improve the world, we need to overcome those things that distract us from being present. And the kinds of workshops and events that we've been doing over a period of about 15 years turn out to enable people to, first of all, recognize what those obstacles are. Often they express themselves as fear, which I view as the opposite of love, or shame, in which one feels one doesn't even deserve to exist. And those things make us want to hide. What we need in the world now, and this is the embodiment in my view of, of uh, SEL, is people who are willing, they have the self-confidence, they are trustworthy so that other people trust that they're being authentic and real. And they can go out in the world and reach out across divides. In divided societies like the US and Mexico, there is too much of that pulling in and not reaching out in a generous and open-hearted way. Fear contracts awareness. It literally contracts awareness. It, uh, <coughs> it uh, puts blinders on people so that they uh, focus more exclusively on their in-group. Uh, they withdraw in the way that Peggy was describing and they, they literally pay less attention, they become unaware of many factors around them. And so the ability to relate in a healthier way to fear, uh, and, and we get so much of that from the media, uh, is an important constituent of social and emotional learning. And in the absence of that, we get hijacked. And so rather than being the rudder, the driver, the the steerer of our own mind, we allow our minds to be swept away like a sailboat in the middle of a turbulent ocean that has lost its rudder. That is uh, what happens to the mind when it is not trained in this way. And that leads to a lot of problems. But the good news is that the very mechanisms in our mind and our brain that allow us to be hijacked, these are mechanisms of neuroplasticity are the same mechanisms that we can use to wake up and to transform in ways that are healthier. Well-being is best regarded as a skill and we can learn well-being. One of the really interesting things about well-being that I want to mention in this little um, discussion here is that well-being is not simply a subjective psychological quality. But well-being matters for many other things. It matters for our social relationships and it also matters for our physical health. I think a start is um, to begin to relate to each other in a different way. And I'll just talk about the US because I live there. <laughs> The polarization that's existing right now in the US is so destructive. And a lot of people fortunately are beginning to realize this and beginning to realize that the polarization comes from many factors, including fear, by the way, um, and is being fomented, unfortunately, by different groups. So the kind of dialogue interventions that, that a number of groups are trying to to foment is the beginning of breaking down what the narrative is about the other person. If you can get them to relate to each other, human being to human being, very often you find that the differences in ideology, for example, are not even important in, if you can get them to talk about the human factors that, that bring them together. This is my belief, you don't have to believe it, but I believe that we're each born with our soul's purpose for, our, for this life on this earth. But the exigencies of life tend to cover that over. We need to take this job because it earns more money even though it's not what we want to do, or you know any example like that. Once we begin to uh, wipe away those layers of this is what I have to do and sink into, okay, but who am I really? What, what is my purpose in life? Then what comes up automatically is philos, the desire to reach out and help others. 
And ironically, the desire to reach out to help others when we start to do it makes us feel better about ourselves. One of the core elements that we see uh, uh, in programs that promote well-being is a reduction in this notion of implicit bias. But again, and the good news is that these same mechanisms that allowed the bias to creep in in the first place can be uh, opportunities for transformation. Another amazing area of research that is getting more and more attention indicates that every human being seems to come into the world with what we call innate basic goodness. Innate basic goodness. These kinds of data suggest that we really do have this preference for pro-social behavior, for generosity, and the single most powerful way to activate circuits in the brain that are important for well-being is through generosity. I like to think of the social tapestry as the writ large as what our society looks like. And if you break it down into each thread, crossing each thread, the way a social tapestry holds together is if there are forces, meaning people, at each of those intersections who are strengthening the social bond, the social capital, you need it in communities, you need it in families, you need it in cities, you need it in the government, you need it in the business sector, in civil society, in religious organizations. However, in today's complex society, what you need even more than those individual intersections is those larger ones across those different sectors. And I think in Mexico, as in the US, there's a lot of trust that's been broken or that's been never developed across those sectors. So one of the things that I think is really important is that we, in whatever capacity we come here in, whether we're a business person, a government person, media, civil society, et cetera, that we begin to think, okay, who is in my ambit, who's in a different position than I am, who I could begin talking to, begin trying to understand their perspective. I think there is an intervention to be done and I think that we have a moral obligation uh, as modern societies to, uh, to engage with these issues in a very serious way because the very future of uh, our civilization and our planet as we know it will depend on, uh, on exactly these issues. Uh, I see, despite all of the um, uh, difficulties in uh, this country, in the United States, and in many parts of the world, I see lots of hopeful signs. Uh, uh, I think that uh, we are recognizing the, um, the challenge of the course that we are currently on. And I think that one of the most important elements here is being able to envision what a future will look like that is different. And I think that it's very important not to allow the problems in our societies today to bring us down, to see that there is an alternative mode of being that is absolutely possible, that each of us can adopt. And having that vision is part of what will allow us to, I think, transform in these ways.